administratively, the Canary Islands belong to Spain. However, by geographical standards, they belong to the volcanic archipelago including the Azores, Madeira, and the Green Cape Islands. The Canary Islands consist of seven larger inhabited and six smaller uninhabited islands, which are located on a 7,500 square kilometer area in the Atlantic Ocean, northwest of Africa. The biggest island is Tenerife, where 625,000 people live out of the 1.5 million population of the group of islands. The world's largest volcano with a 15 kilometer diameter crater can be found on Tenerife. It's called Canadas and last erupted in 1909. We can also find the 3,718 meter high Pico de Teda, which is the highest mountain not only on the Canary Islands, but also in the whole of Spain. All islands are of volcanic origin, which determines their relief and the face of the landscape. The special black sand of the beaches is also the result of volcanic activity. The islands have always been important stopover places for ships traveling between Europe, Africa, and America. In 1492, Columbus spent a few days here. From 1634, the prime meridian was on the islands, but it was moved to Greenwich in 1882. The native flora consists mainly of a wide range of palm trees and cactuses. The most widespread are the agave and the prickly pear. The flower beds decorating the alleys and parks of the cities have been made for tourists' sake. This is also proof that everything here is about tourism, since it gives the main income to the islands. The locals greet tourists with cheer and hospitality. Bananas are among the most important export items of Tenerife, and they're grown in huge plantations all over the island. Iglesia de la Concepción, Our Lady's Conception Church, is the oldest building in the capital city, Santa Cruz. It was built in 1502 around the altar that the Spanish conqueror Fernández de Lugo had built upon his landing. The carved balconies which mix the folk architecture of the islands with religious architecture are interesting and so is the design of the belfry. In the Five Isle Church, not only some parts of the original altar can be seen, but also the flags and weapons used in the victorious battle against Admiral Nelson. Horatio Nelson lost not only the battle, but also his sword at Santa Cruz. We can see the cannon called Tiger, from which he's alleged to have been shot at the War History Museum in Santa Cruz. The first independent flag of the island is also on display here. The most important square of the city is Plaza de España, which is a beautiful park. The huge group of statues dominating the square has been made in memory of the heroes and victims of the Spanish Civil War. From its semicircular column hall, a huge cross rises high, and it also serves as a lookout tower. Behind the monument, the beautiful Californian-style building of the Parliament of the Canary Islands can be found. The group of statues was made by the famous Spanish sculptor Juan de Avalos, commissioned by General Franco. The main figure of the work is an angel symbolizing freedom and a monk who summons the heavens to honor the heroic dead. The monument is guarded by naked juggernauts leaning on their sabers. The wide pedestrian zone leading from the square towards the mainland used to be the center of the city. 
Here stands Canova's monument, the Virgin Bringing Light, which the Italian master created in 1778. The Virgin stands on top of a high column with baby Jesus on her right and a candle symbolizing light on her left. The Guimera Theater was built in 1851 and named after the local dramatist of the 19th century. The dry bed of the Santos River has water flowing in it only during the rainy seasons. The lack of water is one of the main problems of the Canary Islands, which they try to solve by building huge water tanks. The Cerrado Bridge, ornamented with stone lions, spans the brook. Crossing this, we reach the market called Our Lady of Africa. The biggest hall of the city was built in Arabic style and houses the biggest flea market of Tenerife, which can be an interesting sight for tourists too. Inside, there are flower and fruit markets. The pink building is framed by white lacy barriers. Inside, there's a finely curved column hall. And of course, we can find some of the characteristic carved wooden balconies. Above the entrance, there's a clock tower. The capital is proud of its exotic lush green parks, of which the most beautiful is maybe the park named after the former mayor, Garcia Sanabria. The flora of the curving walks is jungle-like, where we can find a wide range of plants from palm trees to blooming tropical bushes. The park is decorated by four beautiful fountains and a flower clock. The volcanic soil, solid lava and basalt, along with the weather, determine the flora. A peculiarity is one kind of canary palm and pinea pine, which grows only on the Canary Islands. Several Mediterranean and tropical plants which flourish on the island of eternal spring have been brought to Tenerife. For example, oleanders, bougainvilleas, and parrot flowers. Countless kinds of cactuses are especially suited for the conditions here. There aren't any parks without them in Tenerife. La Laguna, the old capital city, has grown together with the new one. It has practically become its university and artistic quarter. Its small streets and squares with their good atmosphere are quieter than the ones in Santa Cruz. On the island, traffic is encouraged by not only the fact that it's much cheaper to rent a car than the average in Europe, but also the good quality, 114 kilometers of motorway around the island. The fishing village of San Andre lies on the north, 10 kilometers from the capital. Its coast passage called Las Teresitas is famous for its sand, brought here in four million sacks from the Sahara by ship in 1975, thus transforming the black volcanic sand into golden yellow. A hundred meters from the beach, an artificial dam was built, protecting the sand from being washed into the sea by the waves. On the other hand, it also provides a protected port. Local fishermen depart from here on colorful small ships to the sea, which has an abundance of fish. The statues on the coastal promenades of Candelaria depict nine converted Guanche chieftains who laid down their arms in front of the Spanish conquerors. 
The gouache, with their tall grand figures, blonde hair, and blue eyes, were the natives of the Canary Islands. Their origin has started a lot of scientific debates. They lived in clay huts or caves hollowed into oak trees and had a lot of knowledge about astronomy, were shepherds, and embalmed their dead like the Egyptians. May they have been the survivors of the sunken Atlantis? The biggest museum with guanche relics and findings is in La Palma, but the one in Santa Cruz is also of great importance. Candelaria is a well-known pilgrimage. The sea cast the small carved sculpture of the patron saint of the island, Calendarian Virgin, ashore here in 1390. In memory of this, in 1526, a Dominican monastery was established here. Today, in its place, stands the monumental cathedral built in 1958 with octagonal apse, column hall, graceful wooden balconies, and a belfry situated in a strange dome. The village Guimar, famous for its stone pyramid, is close to Candelaria. Its discoverer was the father of the expeditions Contiki and Ra, Thor Heyerdahl, who died recently. Los Cristianos used to be a tiny fishing village. The appeal of bygone eras can be found in traces even today. But by joining the neighboring Playa de las Americas, it's on the best way of becoming the Las Vegas of the Canary Islands. Here, everything has been built to meet tourists' needs. Luxurious hotels, restaurants with terraces, shops, amusement arcades, bars, and discos. Along its coastal promenades, flanked by palm trees, there are endless lines of apartment complexes. Besides the apartments, which can be rented for a shorter or longer period, or even bought, several hotels can be found at the resorts on the southern coast. Any kind of hotel from one star to five star can be found, but there are much fewer private houses with rooms to let than in other countries, and camping is not fashionable on the Canary Islands at all. The beaches covered by exotic black sand provide a wide range of the usual activities from surfing to jet skiing. The opening hours of shops on the Canary Islands follow Mediterranean habits. Supermarkets are open from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. without a break, while smaller shops have a siesta between 1 and 4 in the afternoon. At night, almost every shop is closed. Banks are open only till 2 p.m. on weekdays, but we should know that there are a lot of banking machines and better known credit cards are accepted almost everywhere. Because the Canary Islands belong to Spain, they're members of the European Union, and the official currency is the Euro. Nowadays, this group of islands is the fastest developing region of Spain, and is a real tourist paradise, capable of receiving 7 million tourists every year. But of course, the sea plays an important role in this, because its water is over 20 degrees Celsius from June to October, and the people living in a country with a rougher climate, especially England and Scandinavia, spend months here. The harbor of Los Cristianos has tried to preserve its ancient atmosphere while huge modern ferries crossing the sea set off to La Gomera, La Palma, and El Hierro. Several cruises start here, for example, ocean fishing cruises or a cruise on a copy of a beautiful old pirate ship. The most interesting may be a glass bottom boat, which takes us to the cliff world of Los Gigantes, where we can adore schools of whales and dolphins. In the 2,000 meter deep water of Musca Bay, pilot whales and bottlenose dolphins live, swimming close by tourist boats out of curiosity, so photos and video recordings can be made of them. 
It's worth knowing that besides on ferries of Los Cristianos, we can get to Lagomera and Gran Canaria by hydrofoil. But there are no ferries between the eastern and western islands. Around Los Cristianos, we can find the most entertainment establishments, such as aquatic amusement parks and delfinariums, Exotic Park, which is a botanical garden with a small zoo, Camel Park, where we can ride a camel, and Eagle Park, which is a special zoo where we can observe animals from special lookout points. In the pedestrian zone and main square of Los Cristianos, we can still see quaint houses of the former village, which have been converted into shops and cafes as we walk among the modern buildings. The atmosphere of Playa de las Americas reminds us of Florida or California. Scenery-like buildings provide tourists with countless sights and attractions. We can see the whole city from hot air balloons flying every 15 minutes. The history of the Canary Islands is interesting and thought-provoking. Although science hasn't proven it, the common cradle of the human race, the island which was called Atlantis by Plato, in all likelihood lies here, in the watery grave among the islands. But Homer, Hesiod, Pindar, Plutarch, and Pliny also wrote about it. Hungarian researcher Miklos Arpadzuge wrote the following. Over Hercules columns that is the Strait of Gibraltar and the big sea that is the Atlantic Ocean lie those broken off pieces of the island Atlantis, which perished before the Ice Age. These are the Azores, Green Cape, Madeira, and the Canary Islands. The king of Mauritiana wrote about the island in the first century, which the historian El Idrisi also mentioned. The first authentic news comes from the writings of Boccaccio, who wrote about the island and the native Guanche people based on stories of the sailor from Genoa, Parocco. The Castilian adventure from the 15th century, Jean de Betancourt, searched for their origin, as did the great geographer of the 19th century, Alexander von Humboldt. Many people think that the Guanche are the survivors of the people in Atlantis. The dragon tree, which survived the Ice Age and grows only here in the world, and the sap of which the Guanche embalmed their dead with, the stone pyramid in Guimari, and uncountable other signs refer to the fact that we still have to search for the missing link of the evolution of the human race. Although statues depicting natives and the findings of museums, nothing else refers to the history of the islands, it is nevertheless worth thinking about. In this way, this paradise of resorts also gives tourists an intellectual experience. The hotels and apartment complexes of Playa de las Americas with shops, restaurants and shopping centers stretch from the coast to the city center. The diversity of architectural styles is impressive. The amazing mosaics of the shopping centers seem like a reflection of the buildings of Hundertwasser in Vienna. Even well-known Hollywood stars like spending their vacation here. However, they're not likely to be driven by the aspect that the Canary Islands are duty-free areas and thus electronic appliances, beverages, and tobacco are much cheaper than in Europe. Traveling by taxi and the use of public phones are also inexpensive. 
tourism has profited from measures on free trade made by Isabella II in 1872. The building of the pyramid-shaped Congress Center, decorated with lines of statues, contains a casino and theater hall. In the latter, flamenco evenings and shows are presented. A luxurious hotel with a swimming pool and tennis court belong to this spectacular building, thus those attending a convention here don't lack anything. Might these statues have been inspired by the gouaches with their impressive figures? Like Las Vegas, where a flourishing city has been created from a dry desert, Tenerife, suffering from the lack of water, is proud of its small pools and fountains. Of course, Los Cristianos and Playa de las Americas don't leave vacationers without entertainment facilities at night either. Spanish restaurants are the most popular places to have dinner, but there are a lot of other kinds too. It's worth trying the specialties of the Spanish cuisine and their versions here on the Canary Islands. We can drink sangria or the famous local wine grown in the neighborhood of Ico de los Pinos, which Shakespeare praised in Falstaff. Those who are still not tired can dance in the nightclubs and discos till dawn. Or spend some time in a casino. Watching a show or a folklore evening will provide a lasting memory. St. Michael Fortress reminds us of a medieval Spanish castle in the village of Aldea Blanca. Several times a week, medieval evenings take place here where we have to cope with delicate dishes without cutlery while we're captivated by a spectacular tournament. The peak of Teide, covered with snow, always provides an amazing sight as it rises above the tropical landscape of palm trees. It didn't catch only the attention of sailors in ancient times. Jules Verne's last novel, Thompson Travel Agency, is staged on the Azores, Madeira, and the Canary Islands. The adventures reach their climax right here on Teda. The novel, written in 1905, gives us an opportunity to compare the islands today and centuries ago. It's of scientific interest that a French astronomer discovered the Halley Comet with a telescope on the peak of Teda. Couldn't have been easy to set up the observatory here because only donkeys were used to carry freight on the dirt roads until 1975 when an asphalt road of good quality was built. We're far from the peak, but the serpentine road gives us a wonderful view. The lower part of the sky is encircled by typical African clouds. In the distance, the island of Logomera disappears in the fog. Canada's Gorge lies at our feet. It's actually the site of an ancient caved-in mountain which had blown up during a volcanic eruption before Teda arose. The walls of the 45-kilometer perimeter crater are 400 to 500 meters high. The clouds, driven by the trade winds and clashing with Teda, become warm and due to the difference in temperature, their moisture condenses. 
That's why on the northern part of the island the sky is often cloudy, while in the southern resorts we can enjoy the sunshine without interruption. On Teide, the snow melts only during the hottest summer months, and the wind is also stronger than below. Anybody traveling here is advised to bring suitable shoes and clothes, and the car will even need snow chains. Forms and colors are luxurious. Black, red, and yellow cliffs form bizarre stone figures. And once again, Jules Verne, who wrote, It's a fact that it would be difficult to imagine a more harmonious view on the right, we can see the huge, endless horizon of the sea. On the left, the abundance of wild and black peaks, and Teda itself rises grandly in the background. Between these two grandiose extremes, the Orotava Valley opens in front of us with lush vegetation. Teda National Park was opened in 1954. Deciduous and evergreen trees dominate the hillsides up to 1,800 meters, above which only bushes, shrubs, and cactuses can be found. Such native plants grow here as candelabrum spurge and prickly pear. The orchea plant also lives here, from which precious red dye has been extracted since ancient times. Besides Tenerife, maybe only in Death Valley can such diverse natural formations be found in a relatively small area. By car, we can travel to the 2,356-meter-high Los Roquillos, from where we can continue by cable car. Passengers can wait in the restaurant of the station if the cable car is brought to a stop because of strong winds. In good weather, we can cover the two-and-a-half-kilometer journey in cabins suitable for 33 people. In the thin air of the mountains, only 163 meters remain to the peak. The Valle de Ucanca Highlands on the way down is like a lunar landscape with unusual cliff formations. Spanish and American filmmakers have shot westerns and fantasy films here. Puerto de la Cruz, the harbor set up in 1648 to transport wine, is the third largest city on the island. From a tourist's point of view, it comes before the capital. Its popularity is unbroken, despite the fact that it's on the north of the island, where the weather is more often cloudy or rainy than in the southern regions. Puerto de la Cruz is the most fashionable resort in all of Spain. Its hotels can accommodate tourists whose number totals several times that of their local population of 45,000 people. Due to favorable taxes and opportunities for loans, many foreigners buy an apartment here. Long beaches on the coast go all the way to neighboring settlements making them a part of the huge resort complex. Elegance and luxury are typical of Puerto de la Cruz.
Fantastic views of the beaches can be enjoyed from several points of the city. Close up, the picture is not so idyllic. Because of the stony, rocky soil and the strong waves, it isn't very pleasant to swim here. More experienced people don't come to bathe here, but to the swimming pool zone called Lago Martinez, leaving the ocean for surfers and fishermen. On the coasts of Tenerife, waves are so strong that all harbors have to be protected by dams and moles. Thanks to the Gulf Stream, the neighborhood of the islands has an ample fish supply. The Plaza Europe and Santo Domingo Street are natural lookout towers stretching above the bay, from where one can observe the snow-white waves breaking on the black stones. The Plaza Europe is a favorite place for those with skateboards and roller skates. The old cannon pointed towards the sea has been standing there since pirates several times sailing under the royal flag attacked the harbors of the island. The ships of Fandadus, William Blake, Sir Jennings, and Admiral Wilson attacked mainly Santa Cruz, but the commercial harbor of Puerto de la Cruz also suffered from them. Because of the pirates' attacks, relatively few old buildings have remained in the city. The similarity of architectural motifs between the buildings of the homeland and Mexico and California, which was under Spanish supremacy for a long time, can readily be observed. The most photographed building of the city is the tiny white church, the San Telmo Chapel. Palm trees cast a shadow on its small garden. Its fence is flanked by colorful flowers and huge agaves. Cesar Manrique, born in Lanzarote, was the most popular architect of the island. The complex, consisting of a cave, lookout tower, swimming pool, and restaurant called Jameo Cel Agua in Lanzarote, has made his name world famous. When he designed Lago Martinez, he designed small, rounded artificial ponds instead of the traditional rectangular swimming pools. The biggest one is 15,000 square meters. In the ponds, there are small islands which may be reached by bridges. A wide range of services, including sauna, solarium, whirlpools, and restaurants can be found in the park, full of tropical plants. Manrique died in a car accident in 1992 but his fame lives on in the buildings designed by him. Andromeda, which can be found in the swimming pool zone, is the most exotic and elegant nightclub in Europe. Opposite it, elegant five-star hotels can be found.
In Puerta de la Cruz, several squares and pedestrian zones with a good atmosphere have been created for the enjoyment of tourists. Nuestra Señora de la Peña Cathedral stands on a square with tropical plants. The three-aisled church from the 17th century is one of the most beautiful buildings of Baroque architecture on the islands. Puerta de la Cruz can glory in some nicely refurbished old buildings among the new houses. San Felipe and Santo Domingo streets, the busiest streets of the old city, are flanked by beautiful houses with carved wooden balconies. The balconies of the hotels look out onto the pedestrian zone. The oldest building of the city is the Royal Toll House. Plaza de Charco is the biggest square of the city. The neighboring houses have been converted into restaurants and cafes, and terraces have been opened in front of the buildings and under the trees on the square. There's busy life here, especially in the evenings. Small inns with great atmosphere in the neighboring streets offer the local specialties tapas and paella. Among the houses, there's a cute small fishing harbor. The small coastal fortress St. Philip was built of massive stones. We can see the beach with black sand from its towers. The botanical garden originally was an acclimatizing center for the plants to be transported to Spain, but because the plants intended for shipment wouldn't acclimatize, they stayed here. Loro Park is the nicest zoo of the Canary Islands. A lot of money and work have been invested to build and advertise it. The name is somewhat misleading. It's much more than the introduction of over 230 kinds of parrots. On the five hectare jungle-like area, we can see several types of large game animals as well. Gorillas, tigers, leopards, and crocodiles. A unique site is the pavilion set up for penguins. The intelligent and friendly dolphins are not only the children's favorite.
It's an unusual experience to watch ferocious crocodiles close up. The Palm House is home to orchids and other exotic flowers. The aquarium is a lavish sight, as if we were taking part in a real scuba dive deep in the ocean. Sharks swim above our heads in a tunnel with glass walls. The parrots will prove that they're not only beautiful and colorful, and seals dazzle their audience with shows. The main attraction of Ico de los Pinos is the dragon tree standing on the square next to San Marcos Parish Church. The locals believe the huge plant belonging to the Yucca family to be one or two thousand years old, but according to botanists, it's only five or six hundred. Around Los Gigantes, the former fishing villages from Playa de San Juan to Puerto de Santiago have joined and offer sandy beaches and good hotels to vacationers. Houses have been built in four or five rows between the water and the cliffs. Building fever is very typical of this area as well as other parts of the island we can see the spiral of prosperity created by tourism. More money makes it possible to build more hotels, attractions, old buildings are restored, parks are made and roads are built, attracting more and more tourists who bring more and more money, and so on. The 
sand of the beaches is cleaned regularly. We can find order, cleanliness, and luxury everywhere. Many people don't know that the islands weren't named after the bird canary, but the other way around. The songbirds with bright yellow feathers are a result of the last four centuries of breeding. Originally, they were insignificant birds with grayish-green feathers, which lived only in the high mountains of Tenerife, and they were called Teda bird. The people who gave the name to the island formed the word from the Latin canis, meaning dog. Some people think the landing people found an unknown corpulent kind of dog here. According to other sources, the Spanish intended to outrage Guanche natives with the word meaning dog. Above the harbors, behind the summer houses on the hillsides, the giant cliffs rise. The blocks of bare cliffs of Tano Mountain are 500 meters high. At their foot, the sea is 2,000 meters deep. Dolphins and whales like living here, and they attract many tourists, especially from Europe, who don't often see dolphins in their habitat. The cliff formations of Los Gigantes are liked not only by tourists, but also by divers and fishermen. Cruise ships often go so close to the cliff walls that the grand natural formations can be touched. <laughs>